All right, we are heading to the text today. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 19 through 25 is our lectionary passage for this morning. It uh, reminds us uh, of the wonderful ways in which the text, uh, particularly in our lectionary, provides for us a, a wonderful uh, continuous roadmap for what uh, the church <coughs> global is struggling and, and reading and attempting to make sense of. And, and I'm glad that from time to time, the, the biblical text really speaks with a certain kind of clarity that I pray and I hope uh, affords all of us a certain kind of clarity. Last week, we came from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and we talked about we have limits and I'm going to continue in that vein a little bit, <clears throat> reminding us that uh, in spite of the difficulty of the hour, the challenge of our uh, kind of day-to-day -day journeys and struggles, that we certainly still have uh, some boundaries, boundaries, bright red lines, if you will, that ought to continue to keep us as God's people uh, with our feet firmly planted as, uh, as the uh, urban prophet uh, 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 says, we got to have what our what, 10 toes down, if you will, uh, on what we know and what we believe and what we trust. And uh, in this way, Hebrews chapter number 10 is going to be the place by which we uh, dive into uh, the promises of God today. I think it's on the screen. And uh, Hebrews is uh, this, this particular letter that is written. Most people <coughs> used to attribute it to the Apostle Paul. Uh, it is thought that it is uh, likely uh, attributed <coughs> excuse me, to uh, someone who is very deeply steeped in the Jewish kind of sensibilities. Uh, they use in particular the, the continuous kind of metaphor and structure and framework and familiarity with uh, the, the Jewish kind of temple and the roles of priests and the roles of, of intercession that uh, the readers of this, this particular letter is thought to have been to a group of Hebrew Christians, a group of Jewish Christians, Christians who are living uh, at least one full generation after Jesus and are struggling with what does it mean to follow Jesus in a very contentious environment. As a matter of fact, most of the Christian scriptures, the New Testament, quote unquote, is written uh, with this framework in mind, written with the backdrop of the empire, the Roman Empire, written with this tenuous relationship with where they live with what they see, and certainly with what they have been uh, taught to believe and or what they have been arrested by with the hope of the gospel. How many of you can bear witness to this uh, experience that you can have a certain perspective of the world and then you have a God experience that radically changes everything? Amen. You, you, you know that there's a certain way in which the world operates and then God gives you another framework, another set of eyes. Dare I say another assignment, another uh, 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 job description, if you will, to ensure that you are not walking by sight, but you're actually using the eyes of faith. And this is, I think, one of the great gifts of this particular text is that it it balances what I believe is the experiential uh, versus your reality. It is this idea that I can have a God-like vision of my contemporary context. And what am I and how am I to live in light of that? So here we go, Hebrews chapter number 10. Uh, we're going to jump in here. The word says this, therefore, my brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, somebody say confidence. Since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that Jesus opened for us through the curtain that is his flesh. Verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, again, using this, this kind of language of priest, this, this idea that there is someone in charge. Mm-hmm. There's someone who has uh, some authority. There's someone whose 
daily responsibility is to take care of the things of God. Amen. The, the writer is trying to remind the people, regardless of what you may think or feel, we have a great high priest over the house of God. How many glad you in the house of God? Now, now, it's important to just acknowledge that the house of God is not this building. Amen. The house of God is not this building. The house of God is you. It's me. It's us. Tell your neighbor, you, you are part of the house of God. And you have a priest who is over the house of God. It's a wonderful thing to know, beloved, that in spite of what you may be going through, in spite of where you are physically located, in spite of the challenges you may face, you always have a priest over the house of God. Man, that, that, that make me want to preach right there. Amen. When, I, when I'm crying by myself, I still have a priest. When, when, when life is turned upside down, I still have a priest. When, when, when things aren't adding up, I still have a priest. And some of you may be like, what is a priest? You know, I'm, I'm not Catholic. I don't be going to the confession. Well, a priest is nothing more than an intercessor. It is nothing more than someone whose life's responsibility is to take care of the things of God. And no matter what season you are in, beloved, you must always remind yourself that you have a great priest that is handling the house of God. Lord, what a reassurance that is. Amen. Uh, let, let, me, let me keep reading verse 22. So therefore, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Lord, have mercy. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Be going to preach on the topic today, this what we not going to do. God bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And God, please send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. And may we be hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray that the people of God say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them this is what we're not going to do today. We're not going there. We're not doing this. This is what we're not going to do. We're not going to do it, so don't even try it. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I was uh, particularly encouraged this week uh, by a former, ment uh, well, he's still a, a current mentor, uh, but also a professor, theological professor, uh, Dr. Robert Franklin, uh, former uh, president of Morehouse and Emory. He's a, a Pentecostal Christian ethicist, brilliant, wonderful brother. And he recalled this quote from Reinhold Niebuhr, who was one of the more prominent uh, Christian theologians during the 20th century, mid 1900s. And this quote was so powerful for me, I'm asking to put it on the screen and leave it up there for a while uh, so we can just take a look at it as we start our sermon. But the, Reinhold Niebuhr says, nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing true or beautiful makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. And nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we are saved by love. If I were to pull out what he 
declares we are saved by. We are saved by hope. We're saved by faith. And we are saved by love. And if there were a certain kind of formula for our survival in perilous times, in times of difficulty, in times where we feel left out, left down, forsaken, or abandoned, feelings are real. But beloved, I want you to know that God is more real. And this idea that the virtues as uh, theologians, uh, particularly in the Christian tradition, name consistently hope, faith, and love. These are the antidotes, if you will, for every season of our lives. Hope, faith, and love. Can you imagine what kind of well, how deep that well is? A well that won't run out when you are tapped into a well of hope. Can you conceive and contemplate how difficult it would be to have a well that runs out of faith? Can you imagine serving a God whose well runs out of love? Faith? hope and love and in moments where our reality beats up against our senses when the reality of the world tries to convince us that there is no hope when the circumstances of our lives tries to exhaust our faith when people you meet or interact with Test your love. I want you to know that this priest has an endless well of faith. An endless well of hope. And an endless well of love. And in these moments of testing, what we not going to do, beloved, is allow our faith, our hope, or our love to be exhausted. On, man. Amen. For how can faith, hope, and love sourced by the almighty God ever be exhausted? I mean, we may get exhausted. How many have been exhausted in your life before? I've been exhausted for about the last two weeks <laughs> sitting in my bed. I was joking with some of my folks. I've been in, in, in sackcloth and ashes trying to figure out, God, what is we going to do? And I heard the Lord say, McBride, what we not going to do? And what you need to tell the people at the way and in your ministries across the country is what we not going to do is allow our circumstances to suggest that we can exhaust God's faith, love, and hope. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them what we not going to do is run out of faith, hope, and love. Now, we may have to cry a little bit through here. But how many know sometimes those tears ain't nothing but the regenerative process? You, you may have to struggle a little bit, but how many of you know that the struggle ain't nothing but a little regenerating of your faith, hope, and love? You may have to ask God some hard questions. But how many of you know even in your questioning of God, there is a process of regenerating your faith, your hope, and your love. And so I do believe that if it's indeed the case that nothing that is worth doing can ever be done in your lifetime, <clears throat> then beloved, I think that takes a little bit of pressure off us to work until we die. Maybe it is what we are doing is we're building upon generational faithfulness. We're building upon generational love. We're building upon generational hope that if I die before I see it, I know that my labor has not been in vain. If my strength fails before the job is done, then I know, God, you always got somebody coming up behind me. 
and therefore my labor has not been in vain. If I can't follow through on that which you placed in my heart, I know, God, my labor has not been in vain, and therefore I need not be pressured by the intensity of the moment, but rather rest in the assurance and confidence that, God, I must be saved by hope if everything is going to take longer than the time I have on this earth. And I want you to know, we who have a sense of history, we acknowledge this. I mean, I want you to think about those individuals who uh, had to live through more harsh times than we have had to. Even yourself, some of us have lived long enough to see progress. Since we were children, since our parents brought us into the consciousness of the struggle of just what it means to be alive. I was, I was, I was listening to an interview uh, by Sister Glow. Okay. Rilla, mm hmm and, 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 and she was, she was, you know, sharing her journey. And I was so captivated by many parts of her whole persona. You know, it was a, 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 a world now renowned sister with a little kind of everyday black woman girl sensibility from the South, the dirty South. I mean, she, she, I mean, she talked like she just, you know, from the Memphis. Memphis. <laughs> All the Memphis folk in the building, you got a representative now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what was interesting as she was talking was uh, particularly about this particular moment, uh, she, she just began to recall, the interviewer asked her, did you ever imagine you would be where you are today? And she said, no, I, 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 I didn't imagine it, but you know, I just, I just kept working and moving. And now I look up and I'm here. And her father, uh, who's an older, older gentleman, uh, came on and just encouraged her. And as I listened to them, just, just have a moment of recollection of how where she is today was not where she was some years ago. And the gratitude that was obviously flowing from her lips during this interview made me think about how God can always take you far in this life, but you won't ever exhaust the journey. And there's always much more that you and I can experience and realize and achieve and still have gratitude even when you find yourself stuck in a very precarious situation. And so beloved, I wanna offer you today that if you and I are going to stay the course, we may not get, as Dr. King says, to the promised land in our lifetime, but I guarantee we're gonna pave a road for some of our children and our grandchildren to get farther down the road than we have today. And if that's the case, the first thing that I want to offer to you today of what we're not going to do is we will not let ourselves go. Somebody holler, I'm not going to let myself go. I, I, I'm not going to let myself go. Verse number 22 says, we must have our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, I want you to appreciate that one of the first challenges I find when you and I are in a moment where we find our hope, our faith, and our love failing is we'll kind of just let go of the rope. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a place of despair and depression where the physiological uh, 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 endorphins and the chemicals in your body start to work against you. Mm -hmm. And they make you feel like you are unable to function. And some of us have become uh, so overwhelmed by the physiological impacts of despair and depression that we kind of just as a act of self-care can kind of just get on low battery mode. Anybody ever understand what low battery? I have, a, I have an iPhone right here, and this phone right now is not on low battery. I, can, I keep trying to turn it off, and it won't turn off. 
But if I put my phone on low battery and I turn it off, it goes off. How many know your body has different modes? There's different ways that you and I function in the world, different levels, right? And I want you to know, beloved, that sometimes as an act of self-care, you must take very seriously the processes and steps to take care of yourself. Going to a therapist, taking your meds, going to the water, looking at nature. I believe we that live here in the Bay Area and pay rent that is way too high. What are we paying for? Well, I believe we're not, we paying for uh, the two seasons rather than the four. Somebody say amen. You can go another part of the country and you're going to pay for all four. You're going to pay for the snow, the ice, the sleet, the rain. You're going to pay for the sunshine, hurricane. You're going to pay for all of it. But here we just paying for two. And we're also paying for the nature. How many of you know that there's a great gift at being able to walk among trees? I know I'm sounding real Berkeley up in here. Some of y'all are like, what is Pastor Mike talking about? I have a friend of mine who, who she came and we was hanging out and she said, my energy's low, I need to go hug a tree. I said, sis, <laughs> I'm hugging a tree. Oh yeah, I, you know, I got to get, get back in touch with nature. I said, well, you can just walk by the water or something. Like what's the hugging of a tree? But you know, I'm not a hater. So I said, whatever you need to do <laughs> to get your equilibrium back on track. Go do what you got to do. But we're paying for not just the, the, the gift of this region and all of its diversity, but we're also paying for the gift of nature. And I want to submit to you, beloved, that part of our task in this season of not letting yourself go into despair, go into hopelessness, go into uh, a sense of unfaithfulness, is to take good care of yourself. Don't let yourself go to the point where you don't, as the scripture says, sprinkle yourself clean from an evil conscience. That you don't wash your body with pure water. This language in the text denotes to me that there is an inside and outside self-care that you and I must prioritize in seasons of challenge. You can't just shout your way through a challenge. And you can't just take a shower through a challenge. You got to clean the inside and the outside if you're going to make it through this season's of difficulty. What will you do, beloved, to purify your conscience? To keep your mind from being swept away by the deception of this age? What will you do, beloved, to make sure that you don't have the negative inputs continuously invading your conscience and it gives you a sense of amorality where you don't feel like there is anything worthy of standing up for? What will you do to make sure you don't comfort each yourself into diabetes or a stroke? Hello, McBride. Amen. What are you doing to make sure you exercise? I love the scripture where it says God created me a clean heart and renew, put in me the right spirit. Wash me and I shall be clean. How many of you need to just ask God, Lord, in this time, I need you to help me purify my conscience. Guard my mind, because there's a lot of misinformation going on out here. There are a lot of voices, and those voices are trying to cause me to let go of the rope. Let go of faith and hope and love, causing me to think that the way to, to victory is to close in on myself, when actually the way to victory is to be wider in your faith, be deeper in your love, and be more hopeful in what God is doing among us. So these are the questions, beloved. If you will make it through this season intact, and I believe we will, because I believe we are a people 
who have made it through worse times before. I don't want you to think that we're the first generation of folk who've had to live through hard times. My friend Linda Sarsour was speaking uh, to a group of immigrants in, in, uh, in, in New York yesterday, and I found her words to be most prescient. She said, how many of you know that during Democrat and Republican administrations, we've had to protect immigrants? During Democrat and Republican administrations, we've had to protect women's bodies. During Democrat and Republican administration, we've had to deal with mass shootings and gun violence in the neighborhood. We've had to deal with the criminalization of our communities. We've had to deal with terrible economies. We've had to deal with all kinds of challenges under every administration. But guess who's been there every time? The great high priest. And we are here today because of faith, love, and hope. Oh, you ought to holler, I can't let myself go. I, I'm not going to throw in the towel, but I'm going to stand firm. And the God that's brought me through time and time again. Second thing I want you to declare today is I will not become a monster. Lord have mercy. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I won't become a monster. This is what we're not going to do. We're not going to become the very thing we're resisting against. Now, this is hard. This is hard because there is this idea out here, and sometimes I subscribe to it, that we got to fight fire with fire. Lord have mercy. I told somebody, he said, Pastor Mike, how can I pray for you? I said, you better pray I don't become that Turner. That's what your prayer better be. Man, because y'all fooling around with somebody that, 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 hey amen. Don't make me angry when they say, you ain't going to like me when I'm angry. But how many of you know that fighting fire with fire creates a greater inferno? You don't, you don't put out a fire by, by adding more fire to it. Is it not what Audre Lorde says that we cannot dismantle the empire with the emperor's tools? And some of us are more familiar with the tools of empire, with the tools of evil, with the tools of retribution than we are with the tools of love. Some of us are more familiar with the weapons of this carnal world than we are with the tools of faith. We're more familiar with the weapons and the agents of, of, of destruction than we are with the tools of hope. And how can you and I Make sure we do not become a monster. The scripture says it like this. Let us consider how to provoke one another. Listen to love and good deeds. Lord, I, there's a lot of provocateurs in the world today. How many of there's a lot of provocateurs in your life? How many can be honest and say, I don't know who sent this provocateur. I'm here minding my own business. And all of a sudden, I got this provocateur. You know what a provocateur, right? It's someone who's able to, to, to and they're skilled in their provocations. They, they, they know, you know, how to, how, to, how, to, how to turn you up. You over here minding your own business, all of a sudden, you just angry. You're like, why am I angry? Because of provocateur. Someone asked me, Pastor Mike, do you believe that the devil can, uh, can, can, can possess a, 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 a follower of Jesus or anybody without their permission? I said, no, nah, I don't think so, because I don't think the Holy Spirit can do that either. So I don't think the devil has more power than the Holy Ghost, but I'll tell you what the devil can do. He can get, all, get you to be a provocateur. The devil can know how to push you and, and nudge you and get you all in my, 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 my sore spot. It was kind of like, you know, uh, now the, the, the fight with Tyson, you know, I, 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 you know, I was, you know, a little bored. I was at the Warrior game watching it on my phone. And I'm just glad I went to the Warrior game. Somebody say amen. It was... <clears throat> but the, night, the, the day before, when Jake stepped on his foot, I think Tyson forgot whatever agreements they had. Why? Because Jake provoked Tyson. He didn't want to quit right hook. Before they knew what was happening, he was, you know, backing up and, you know, it was like provocateurs. Provocateur is someone who knows how to nudge you and bring out a reaction in you that is unconscious to you. Know how to get you out your character. Move you off your block. Keep you from being ten toes down on faith, love, and hope. But the scripture says what? That we must provoke one another to love and good deeds. I want you to ask yourself, what are you doing this week to provoke somebody? 
to love and good deeds. When you feel like you're being provoked to being violent, to being destructive, to being retributive. God, how can I, how can I, how can I provoke someone to doing the right thing? Who, how many know you gonna have to be led by God? You got to be so in touch with God that Lord, I want to be a provocateur of love and good deeds among the wicked. Whew. It's easy to provoke somebody love and good deeds when you on the same page. But I believe that there's a power God wants to cultivate in some of us that will allow us to be transformed into agents of love amidst the hatred. Agents of justice amidst injustice. Agents of good deeds amidst corruption. God, how can I in this season not become the very thing that my enemies, my antagonists, my adversaries are already becoming. How can I reverse course? Sometimes you gotta take a step back and say, God, I'm gonna trust you right along through here. And I'm gonna hold on to my character. Why? Because it's my character that's brought me to this point in the first place. I know some of us got a lot of education. How many got a lot of education? Some of got a lot of money, maybe not as much your education. Mm -hmm. But I want you to know, beloved, that it is your character. It is God's favor. It is your ability to be faithful to God that has got you to this point. And that's why we got to keep reminding ourselves, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. Why? Because God says they will soon be cut down. When God starts to cut folk down, I don't want to be in that number. I'd rather lose <laughs> whatever material things I got than be on God's cut down list. Hello, somebody. I'd rather God allow me to keep drinking from the wells of faith and hope and love rather than be on God's cut down list. And that is how we resist the, 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 the predilection to become monsters is by staying on God's path. Because every choice you make, beloved, it can start to turn you into something else. And the, the way we stay on God's path is in community. It's, the, it's, 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 it's great that the scripture says that we must not stop gathering together as some people do. How many of you can, can honestly say that there are moments in my life where isolation feels easier than community? Especially if you're an introvert. God bless all the introverts. I'm introvert sometimes. There are some moments where, you know, I can just be by myself. Don't talk to me. Don't call me. Don't do nothing. I'm fine. I'm fine with just being left alone. And then I realize that that becomes its own prison. That becomes hard to unlock the door from. Sometimes you got to force yourself to be among your people. And I want to I want to I want to be very clear about this idea that sometimes you got to find a tribe. That is not a tribe that perhaps has your same last name or your same uh, 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 belief system. Sometimes it's a tribe of people who will just know your name, who will be glad to see you coming, who won't take advantage of you or abuse you. Sometimes you got to lean into this community in hard times rather than isolate yourself. Because in your isolation, isn't it interesting that the devil always has a key into your locked rooms? The devil always knows how to get past your locked doors and you be in there. The Lord is always there, but it seems like the Lord being there in your locked room, the devil seems to have the, the, the louder voice. The devil seems to know how to talk to you in a way when you isolate it. That drowns out the voice of God. And that's why you and I have to practice leaning into community. I refuse 
to lock myself in a prison of isolation and be, you know, a, a, a roommate with the enemy, be a roommate with my own thoughts, be a roommate with the doomsday loop in my brain. No, I will keep asking God, Lord, give me faith, give me hope, and give me love for this season. So I won't turn into the monster that I know I must defeat. And the last thing the scripture says, oh, in verse number 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. Lord, how many know that this needs to be your confession, that, that I know that God is able to keep me from falling. This needs to be my confession, that I know that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all I can ask or think. This is my confession, that I know that no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. This is my confession that even when the enemy comes against me that I know God will not allow me to be defeated this is my confession that the devil may be busy but God is more busy the devil may be coming against me but God is already there this is my confession that I will be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord uh, this is my confession uh, that God will not leave me uh, or forsake me. Uh, this is my confession uh, that even though trial may be on the left hand uh, and trouble may be on the right hand, uh, that God knows how to carry me all the way through it uh, and I shall have victory and power uh, and no defeat. Uh, somebody holler victory! Power and no defeat. And I believe that God wants you to know, beloved, that you can't go there today. You can't be given into despair today. You can't be given into challenge today. But you gotta keep resisting. You gotta keep pushing. You gotta keep struggling for righteousness' sake. Because after a while, I think help is on the way. I I think power is on the way. I think deliverance is on the way. Somebody shout hallelujah. This is what we're not going to do. We're not going to allow ourselves to be overwhelmed and overcome. But we will hold on to faith. We will hold on to hope. We will hold on to love. I may not have more money than you, but I can certainly provoke you to love. I'm looking for some schemers in here who can cultivate hope among the hopeless. I'm looking for some sanctified manipulators in here who can turn haters into lovers. I'm looking for somebody who is atheistic and believes that faith is the gift that can take root in anybody's heart. Hug, give your neighbor a high five. I'm telling them this ain't what we're going to do. We're not doing this today. Come on, stand with me to your feet, everybody. Grab the hand of somebody and let's just declare this is what we're not going to do. We're not going to live as people without faith. We're not going to live as people with no hope. We're not going to live as people without love. Oh, but God, I and we will constantly remind ourselves as 2 Corinthians verse 4, chapter 4, verse 16. Close your eyes and just hear these words. The scripture says it like this. This is from last week's scriptural text. So we're not giving up. Somebody say, I can't give up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us. But on the inside, God is making new life. Somebody say, God's making new life in us. Come on, say it again. God's making new life in us. Not a day goes by without God's unfolding grace. So these hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things that we experience now are here today and gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see, they last forever. I want you to just squeeze gently the hand of your neighbor and just say, God, make this last forever. 
God, faith, make it last forever. Hope, make it last forever. Love, may it last forever. May my neighbor, God, be filled with the power, God, that never runs out. May it, God, be something that they tangibly can resource in moments that are needed. May they be able to make, Lord, withdrawals from the deposits of this sanctified gift that is faith, love, and hope. And God, may they draw a bright red line and remind themselves this is what they're not going to do, God. May my neighbor never let go of the rope. May they never let themselves fall into despair. May they continuously guard their mind and their body, sprinkling, oh God, with the fresh and pure water from your spirit. God, may they always, God, be people who are able, God, in this season and in this moment to God crap on the love crap on the hope crap on to faith in the name of Jesus heal the brokenness in my neighbor speak peace to the anxiety in their mind God usher them from a place of anxiety to a place of confidence God may they know today that they are in your hands And may it, God, be an undeniable reality that no circumstance can shake their faith. No hatred can exhaust their love. No despair can exhaust their hope. Do it for my neighbor today. Now lift those hands where you're standing. It's me, God, and I stand in the need of prayer. It's not my mother. It's not my father, my sister, nor my brother. But it's me, Lord. I need you to heal my body. I need you to touch my mind. I need you to fortify my spirit. I need you to heal and repair this relationship. I need you, God, to give me, Lord, peaceful rest. I need you, God, to help me find joy in the midst of my crazy season. I need you, God, to bring clarity and direction. I need you to help me find my tribe. I need you, God, to help me remain faithful to you. So God, I need a special blessing. Save me, somebody say, save me, Lord. Heal me, somebody say, heal me, Lord. Deliver me, somebody say, deliver me, Lord. Do it right now, God. And we'll say thank you, God, for answering our prayer in Jesus' name. You may be here today, you need somebody to touch and agree with you. You need somebody to pray with you. You need somebody to just, just, just anoint you with oil so you can leave with the confidence that hope, faith, and love is following you out the door. Come on and let's meet at the altar just for a few moments and we can pray together. We can seek the face of God together. Come and let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. God, we want, we need, we gotta have a touch from you today, God, and I will not leave without this touch. I will not leave without this affirmation. I will not leave without you. Come on, ministers and and workers. Come on, let's pray. Let's anoint. Let's touch and let's agree with our loved ones today that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. So God, I lift my hands to you. Come on, lift those hands to God. God, we lift our hands to you, God. And as our ministers come and touch and agree, I just want you to begin to pray. I just want you to begin to call out to the Lord. I just want you to begin to say, God, I receive the blessings. I receive the anointing. I receive your power. I receive your victory, God. I receive it. 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 Right where I'm standing, right where I'm I'm, 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 I'm kneeling, right where I'm sitting, I receive the blessings of the Lord. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. Oh God, oh God, I receive it.